Hey there, everybody, and welcome to tonight's episode of the Day Tripper Photo Show. Tonight, we're going to talk about the Briangle, as shown on the screen currently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to rewind that and watch it back. Fun stuff. Uh, <laughs> the Briangles. It's a funny joke that we uh, actually, Dr. Ross kind of coined that a few years ago. Uh, talking about the exposure triangle, I'm always talking about aperture, shutter speed, ISO, and how these things work together. So Ross coined it, the bri angle, and kind of went with it. Anyway, trademark that. So, uh, yeah, tonight's episode, we're talking about how you expose your sensor to light and uh, the whole thing that goes on every time you adjust one thing, the other things are adjusting and so on. So we're going to get into a little bit more about that. Um, we've got a lot of cool things to talk about, but first, let's just introduce ourselves quickly. Uh, my name is Brian Weiss. I own Day Tripper Photo. We run photo day trips teaching you how to use your camera. In fact, uh, we're going to show some photos from... Uh, the past Muskoka wildlife day trip that we just did, uh, there was kind of an interesting encounter. Uh, our good friend Anthony <laughs> got into, um, note to self, when entering a wild wolf cage, do not wear dead animals on your head. Anyway. Uh, hey, this looks like a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't quite like that, and we will defend Anthony on this, because it's a really great photo, and nothing, nothing bad was happening except for a moment in the frame of a photo. So, anyway. Um... <laughs> That's what I'm all about. If I work at Henry's in Newmarket, and uh, Henry's is a good camera store. I love it there. Uh, lots of great people I work with, and they give us a lot of really cool things that we can play with and practice with and talk about on the show sometimes, but not tonight. So uh, maybe next time. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's me. Uh, if you want to pay attention and watch this show and ask us questions live tonight, please go right ahead and do so. You can go to www.youtube.com slash user backslash Mr. Snaps1, which is kind of written easier for you to remember right there at the bottom of my screen, yeah, right there. And uh, you can go to the website, www.daytripperphoto.com. And to the very far end, we have our good friend back again, back from helping his friend move last week, um, which I never really said that's why you were gone, because <laughs> I totally <laughs> forgot, I'm sorry. Gabriel, sir. I'm watching this show, and you're like half an hour in. I'm like, is he going to mention that I'm not there? Or is he going to pick on Canon the entire show, you bunch of cowards? A little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. <laughs> like, they don't even mention, oh, Gabriel's not your Canon sucks. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> no, we got to. Can, can we make him go away? Can we make him go away again? <laughs> Well, welcome back to the show tonight, Gabe. Uh, it's nice to be back. Yeah, just, you know, helping a friend move, a friend in need is a friend. Ah, crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you're a good guy. You're a good guy. <laughs> so what else have you been up to? I heard uh, you had a nice wedding shoot that you just finished up. Oh, a beautiful wedding shoot uh, last weekend, which was great. Um, had a fun Easter. It's always fun when you're... Um, you know, an atheist around around Easter, and you're trying to explain to your child why the Easter Bunny drops chocolate eggs. It's like, ah, where do I start? Um. <laughs> <laughs> and the letters but. start to come in already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it was fun. I had lots of fun with the families. So did a beautiful wedding shoot, which I'm going to show a little bit, a little bit of <clears throat> later on, and uh, spent some time with the family, and yeah, been shooting jewelry and just. Happy with the camera in my hand. I was spending some time with the family for Easter as well. I was over at Shelly's aunt's place, and we watched the Bible on the Discovery Channel. Um, no, it wasn't on the Discovery Channel. Oh, History. History Channel. History Channel. Oh. I got to tell really? you, it on was the, the most History gruesome. Channel? It was the most gruesome thing I've ever seen. I mean, people talk about movies being violent. Yeah. Just read the yeah. Bible. Oh, <laughs> horrible. Anyway, sorry. Sidetrack much. Anyway, anything else going on this week, bud? Uh, no, not for me. No? Okay. Are you still here? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Momentary lapse of reason there. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, I, um, no. Besides that, just working away, editing. You know, the, the nice thing about enjoying a beautiful wedding in the sun for, for four hours, I mean, three <laughs> days locked in your office editing. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, That's yeah got to take the good with the bad. Yeah. Take a good with that. <laughs> All right. Welcome back, sir. I'm glad you're here tonight, and we're going to have a lot of fun. It's good to be back. And Darren, sir, how have you been this week? I've been doing good. 
was a was a nice Easter chasing Easter bunnies and uh, scaring the eggs out of them, mugging little <laughs> kids taking their Easter eggs. You know, just all that kind of fun stuff. Lots of love picking, on our show. Picking on the atheist cannon shooters and you know having lots of fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, learn that learn that driving your car and trying to take pictures of your dog drooling like like a rabid dog in the back seat's probably not the best idea, you know, point the camera backwards when you're trying to drive the car. I guess that would be considered a handheld device, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, but it depends if the cop would actually see you doing it. So, we'll have to call Brian Smith and find out about the legalities there. <laughs> I did pretty good. I, I didn't I didn't swerve at all, so as uh <laughs> and you know, of course, the car being stopped at the time probably helped a little bit in that. <laughs> ah, that's the important part we needed. Good, good, good. Well, Darren, like last week and every week, thank you for being on our show tonight as well. Um, ah, we got a lot of. of we, it is. I'm having such a good time doing the show. This is episode number twenty-eight, which is pretty sweet. Uh, just means that we are halfway to almost being halfway to the end of our show, or something. <laughs> I don't know where we're going with that. <laughs> we got lots of shows left to go. <laughs> All right, this is what Gabe's thinking. Oh, what is happening with the show tonight? Uh, time for a week. I wasn't filled in on. <laughs> uh, there's no timeline. I'm just talking up my butt. Did you see the picture of me a minute ago? It's exactly what happens. <laughs> anyway, so for those of you who need to get a hold of Darren. You can get a hold of him at the dgvirtualtours.com. He's got that right up there at the bottom of his page, or so. So I see. Yeah, Darren at dgvirtualtours.com. And yeah, if you need to there. hire, there it is. Sorry, put you back. Uh, if you need to hire an awesome wedding photographer, and you will see how awesome he is in a few minutes, some great photos from his last shoot, then get a hold of Mr. Gabriel Bousquet and his lovely wife, Trish, to shoot your weddings and so on and so forth. Okay. Thank you very much. So we're going to go into something a little different. Um, we talked about this big uh, day trip that we had at the Muskoka Wildlife Center for a few seconds, uh, a few minutes ago. Mm. I and just want to say, um, just butting in for a moment because I can do that. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> you're polite and you don't stop me. <laughs> um, the pictures that I've seen come from the students from from that trip, fantastic job, guys. I mean, just incredible. The, the color, the the detail and the fur, the, the the focus. I mean, people really got the focus bang on. Uh, all the pictures that I saw, the focus was right on the eyes, which is exactly where you want to see it. Uh, just fantastic pictures. I was really, really, really impressed. You know what? I am too. And I'm going to share a couple here. Um, one of the young ladies that was with us, her name is Kayla. And uh, Kayla got a few really great shots. And I'll do a quick screen share here if I can because my screen sharing capabilities are fairly weak. So here's one shot of the wolf that Kayla shot. And if I move forward, there you go. Being in the cage with wolves, I mean, come mm. on. How cool is that, right? Yeah. We were so beautiful close. Beautiful color, beautiful you know, texture and detail in the fur. And then the silver fox. She got the one with that's, snow on its nose. Mm -hmm. that, that's really hard to shoot, too, because black on white is just one of those really challenging situations for cameras. It's so true. And, you know, she did such a great job. And as uh, Gabriel was saying, I mean, so many people who were on this trip shared photos on the community, and that was just fantastic. And if you want to see that, guys, just go to the Day Tripper Photo community. You'll see all of these photos that we're sharing here now. Um, let's see what else Kayla got. Oh, yeah, Luna the Owl. Mm -hmm. The Telus Owl. Yep, the Telus Owl. This is the owl that was used in the Telus commercials. And uh, she's so small, she weighs less than 100 pounds. Or 100 pounds. That would be very small. <laughs> 100 grams. Literally 100 grams. Actually, she's like 86 grams. She's super it's, tiny. It, it's so funny because when you see that picture, your, your, your brain is used to seeing owls that are this big. You know, I can't go much higher than this. And then you see, you see a picture of Luna on somebody's finger, and she's this big. Uh huh. The cutest little thing. Like and she, she has can't such a big bite a human finger because her mouth isn't big enough. <laughs> actually, it's funny you say that because one of the photos I have is her opening her mouth up to a finger, and I'll show that in a sec. Just keep going with Kayla's shots. She doesn't have too too many more here. There's the lynx, Yeti, uh -huh. the lynx, awesome cat. We were in there with that uh, with Yeti as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's a couple of those shots. I'll stop my screen share there. 
and there were so many more. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to open up quickly one of my images of what, what you're talking about there. Now that you've mentioned it, you've got me thinking about it. Um, it was just such a great day. I mean, we got in the cage with Luna, or not in the cage with Luna. We took some great photos of Luna, the owl. We got in the cage with the wolves. Um, here we go. Here is that one shot. So you can really get a, a good idea of the scale. She's such a cute little owl. Yeah, very cute. Got a tiny little thing. Oh, she's just so small. And she's such a big personality, too. Like, she was looking around. She's able to move their head. You know, they don't move their head. Actually, I didn't realize that their eyes don't move in their head. They have to turn right. their whole head because their eyes don't turn. They, the entire cavity of their brain. Yeah, I didn't realize skull. that either. That's well, because they have huge aperture. That's right. They actually do, which is a good segue to the next little bit of uh, information. Well, maybe not the next bit. I think you want to talk something about this really cool thing that Google Plus is doing. Yeah, okay. So two Gabriel? quick two quick notes. Everybody knows that I'm a, a fan of Google Plus uh, for many reasons, but one of the one of the reasons is for photo sharing. And Google Plus just um, enabled full resolution uploads. So and I'm gonna do a quick walkthrough and hopefully I can find it. If you go Go to settings. So just at your, your Google Plus homepage, click on the gear box, click on settings, and scroll down all the way down. You'll see an option there under photos. Upload my photos at full size. Um, now you get, I think, five gigs of free storage. Um, so you can upload photos at insane resolutions after you after you enable this but any photo stored at uh, I always forget this number 2048 um, resolution 2048 or lower doesn't count against your storage you can store unlimited photos at uh, 2048 um, pixels uh, either wide or high, it doesn't it doesn't matter. And oh, that's not show my email there. <laughs> I'm trying to help you out. <laughs> um, and so with 2048, if you go to here and here are those great wedding photos we were talking about. Here's, yeah, I, I'm going to go through a couple of these. So you can zoom in pretty far, and it, it actually it looks really nice. Um, at, at 2048, but full resolution. When you zoom in, I, I enabled full resolution uploads. You can take this picture and zoom way, 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 way in. And really, I mean, you can see it really keeps the detail and looks looks absolutely fantastic. So that's a great one up that um, that Google Plus has over just about any other, any other service, whether it be 500 pics or. Um, I think even Flickr, you have to have a pro account, I think, to upload super high resolution images. And Google Plus doesn't, uh, sorry, Facebook doesn't let you do any of that stuff mm. at all. So, uh, and another cool, really cool, I thought this was an April Fool's joke, a feature that they released is when you um, look at a photo, and I'm actually going to start off with, um, with a different one. Um, really quickly and then hop back to that one. Where is one I was looking for? Here you go. So when you look at a photo, you've got all your little buttons up here for rotate, auto fix, delete, edit, and it's got this one here called add, add emotion. So you can click this button and it actually analyzes the photo and puts a little emoticon bubble <laughs> up there and sort of tries to encapsulate what it you know what it sees and you'll notice that the little emoticon actually is wearing glasses because she's wearing glasses and you just click it again it'll take it away or you can just leave it up there if you want but what caught my attention was how accurate it is it's absolutely insane so here's a picture here I tested it on this one so okay actually you know what this one it didn't it didn't work as well as it did on the others um, but here's one that I tested on that I was really impressed with. Here. And it actually got, like, that's sort of a serene smile. 
and that's what she has on her face. That's you know just sort of a, a relaxed, calm after the storm sort of smile. And then the next one, which blew Brian and I away because we did it in preparing before the show, is this one here. Not only does it get all the people with glasses, but it gets a little baby here and it puts a little tuft of hair right on the top of its head, and it's adorable. It's absolutely adorable. So it's you know for and he gets the big toothy smile here and the big nice smile there and everything so you know for a wedding it doesn't really fit for wedding pictures but if you're shooting a birthday party or you know just fun images it's a it's it's a quick way to just add some fun to your images hmm. um, and this is this is that wedding that I shot last week last weekend at Angus Glen and so it's a beautiful location beautiful couple and uh, we got, I'll show you my favorite picture. Here's my favorite picture from the day. Yeah, it's nice. So, yeah, just a couple Beautiful. of quick uh, Google Plus updates. So full resolution images and add, uh, add emot emoticons to the images, which is just kind of fun, fun to play around with. That's cool. I've been getting a few little comments that the show is kind of uh, slagging, getting a little slow. So hopefully it'll work itself out and cool. uh, it'll speed up over time. Hopefully, I'll close a couple of windows on my machine just in case. Okay, I, I kind of did the same on mine as well. So hopefully, okay. that won't happen. Close the iTunes and all that kind of stuff. Cool. Yeah. All right. So great stuff. Some interesting new things that Google Plus is doing. They're always improving. Um, yeah, there's been some big changes. Uh, Google Plus hired Brian Mateus, who is a uh, guy who was on On One Software, and now he is the community director for Google Plus. And he pledges to make Google Plus more um, accessible to people, and uh, it's just it's just beginning, guys. This is all just mm -hmm. beginnings, and uh, you guys are with us at the start. So one yes. one last thing for people that haven't heard, uh, Google bought Nick Software, mm -hmm. and everyone was like, "Oh, they're going to shut it down," blah 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 blah, and uh, so they shut down the desktop editor for Nick Software because the two people that used it, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> They have Can this thing called Photoshop and uh, Lightroom, but anyways, um, and uh, so the Nick, the biggest thing with Nick software is Snapseed, which is the iOS and, and Android uh, photo editing platform, and then the biggest thing for photographers are the Photoshop and Lightroom plugins, and that's a lot of photographers use that as their primary plugins. So not only did Google not discontinue it, but it used to be about about $125 per plugin, and there's five or six plugins. And they made it so that the entire plugin pack, right. every single plugin that they offer, is $150. And if you've bought one plugin in the past, and not only the, to buy it, that's right. That's go ahead. That's what I'm saying. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, if you've bought one of the plugins in the past five years, you should be receiving an email soon, uh, giving you access to every single plugin that they offer free of charge. So they Googled it, Beautiful. and it was awesome. Very cool. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. So now another cool thing about the Nick software is uh, the next Day Tripper photo session, um, well, not the next one, but the Algonquin session, we actually have a gentleman who used to actually be a rep for Google+, Plus, or not for Google+, Plus for Nick, um, T. Christie. Krusty. Uh, he's actually going to be coming on our day trip and giving a whole presentation on how to use Nick software while we're having our lunch in between some of our things oh, in awesome. Algonquin. So, yeah, we're going to get some pretty good first-hand tips on how to use this Nick stuff right from the man who used to sell it. And I say used to because when they were bought out by Google, they did have to get rid of a few people. But, uh, yeah, it's too bad. He's, he's still doing well in the industry. He's just not with Nick anymore for some weird reason. Anyway, he'll be teaching us a few cool things anyway. Um, what else here? Oh, yeah, so I guess Sean says that uh, he just, Join it looks good. It's working great now. Ron says, "Excellent, beautiful. Thanks, guys, for the update. So we really appreciate it." It's iTunes. That. Had to be. Yeah, it's always iTunes. Any Mac app, it has to be. Apparently, <laughs> Gabe's back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the Bry angle. <laughs> I, yeah, thought the Bry angle. I thought that was Looney Tunes. I thought that was Looney Tunes. That's all, folks. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
No, that's cool. Uh, now, guys, don't forget you can join in our conversation. I know a few of you have already been posting to us, and that's great. But you can go to the Day Tripper Photo community on Google Plus and talk to us through that. You can talk to us through the YouTube page. We're going to be trying to pay attention to all of this stuff. So if anybody has any comments that they want to give us, and I promise this week I will update my YouTube link so I will uh, actually be able to <laughs> see what people are saying before the end of the show, which is important. Because I did last week, and it was bad. Anyway, uh, anything else to add on that? I think we're good to move forward. Yeah. Um, so the Briangle. Let's talk about that. What do you guys think about exposure? Do you like exposing something about exposure? Huh? Oh, oh, you mean photography exposure? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's all it's all trickery. It's all trickery. It's it's fake. It's all fake. It's not. Real. I don't like these people plot. that record things. It's I, I, it's, <laughs> it's no good. <laughs> the funny thing about that, um, as far as exposure, I'm talking about the stupidity of, of some things. Um, our naked photography episode has way more views than most of our other episodes. And way fewer minutes watched than any other episode. <laughs> <laughs> that was the coolest show we ever did. And it I mean was that in more ways than one. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, YouTubers are <gasps> naked photography, click. No nudity, yeah. click. <laughs> yeah. But of course, the most viewed and the most actually watched show in the history of Day Tripper, uh, the Day Tripper Photo Show, is uh, the Nikon Show with more views and way more mi minutes watched than any other show. And it's weird that the Canon Show is just very few minutes watched on. Anyway, it doesn't really matter, but uh, good stuff. Thank you all for watching our show back and uh, contributing, and especially you know liking Nikon like you do. So <laughs> we got to keep joking about this because last week it was a whole Nikon panel, and this week finally Gabriel's back. So he's supposed to be defending it much more vigorously than he is, but I'm sure he has his moments that he'll pick and choose. Well, <laughs> as a watching. Canon user, I think he just figured out how to take off his lens cap, uh, obviously Ooh. by the some of the wedding photos he took that, you know, they're actually turning out pretty good. So it helps you take off the lens cap on a camera. <laughs> Nikon cameras, you can shoot right through it. Right? It becomes actually, invisible. It's one of these, you know, it's one of these translucent types of materials. If you forget to take it off, you can just go right Transparent through. metal. Yeah, yeah I'm, right. I'm waiting for the, uh, the, the dark continent comment. <laughs> <laughs> because something actually really frustrates me. And if you see me at the store... At Henry's in Newmarket, specifically, uh, we we have these these flyers from Nikon, and it says you know two letters identify you as a great person in life or something, and then at the other page it says FX, as if to say that because you own a full frame camera, then you're something spectacular. Um, right. You know that that kind of irked me. I'm not a big fan of selling a full frame to somebody who doesn't really need a full frame. I think there's a specific reason for buying something that expensive or that specific as as far as what a benefit mm -hmm. goes. Um, and then maybe you can quickly <clears throat> talk about their latest. Uh, so um, Nikon, it, it was reported on DP Review. I was reading it on Google Plus today. Nikon just uh, released a. Um, um, I'm going to pull it up here so I can get all my all my wording big, down big right. Big game sporting scope, for a spotting scope for putting on your rifle so you can shoot big game. Yeah, so engineered so for Safari, Nikon Sport Optics Division claims that the new Monarch series scopes are created for those seeking dangerous game adventure on the dark continent. <laughs> Which, for those of you that don't know, because I didn't, I didn't know when I read it, dark continent is an archaic term for Africa. So it's basically like, look at our great lenses, and we're racist. So... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Not takes cool, all kinds, Nikon. right? Not cool. No, <laughs> this is this is what we're talking about. Engineered for Safari, the spotting scopes on the guns. Now, there are. I, I have no problem with hunting. No problem. Mm -hmm. I feel it's very controlled. I feel that you know people who respect the guns and who treat them right, like our good friend Dr. Ross. Um, there's there's respect for the whole thing, but by going back to comments like talking about the dark continent and going to Africa, making these things just so you can go kill big game in Africa when that's really not really looked on very fondly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Nikon needs to rethink a strategy or two. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, if you're using using that to kill game to feed your family, you know, that's one thing. 
you know, to sell them to, to um, the people, the Inuit and the people that are up in the, you know, Northern Territories that, you know, they need to hunt game and that's how they survive for the winter. You know, that's, you know, that's fair game. That is very valid, actually. That, that's a very, very good point. So, you so know, they are, they are we, useful, but... Are we the light continent? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. It, it's just, you know, you can sell them really well without the racist overtones. I don't know. Maybe, maybe people that are looking for big game, you know, maybe maybe that appeals to people that are looking for that type of product. I don't know. But uh, I have a feeling it's not going to go over well within the webosphere. No. Maybe something not. got lost in the translation and maybe they didn't mean it as it came out. You know what? The other thing, too, is it could have been, you know, I, I had never heard that term before. So if I, you know, if, if I had seen somebody else refer to it, I would not have known that that was a... Actually, no. I probably would have dark continent. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna refer to anything as a dark continent. So scratch that. Somebody. Well, I mean, somebody... Sa sa sand is white, so I don't know why they call it a dark continent. I know it's a very bright <laughs> continent. A lot of sun. A lot of sun. I have a feeling somebody's getting reprimanded or fired over this. Hopefully, but, it's uh, not me for having this conversation right now. So, uh, <laughs> Z passed it a little bit, even though I brought it up. Anyway, uh, I just want to quickly make a quick. Shout out to our good friend Don. Den Denis reminded me of uh, Don Komreshka, our, our buddy. Uh, he's been on our show a few times. The Snowflake guy, uh, affectionately known as, even though he's like so much more. Um, he was on the Trey Ratcliffe Variety Hangout this week, and it was great watching him. The photos he was showing, mind-bending. Um, I have to admit, I think a few people who showed photos after him felt a little bit awkward showing photos after Don's photos because <laughs> the dude is so incredible. Uh, and if you didn't know what I'm talking about, go to doncom.ca and check out his website. He's still trying to raise some funds to get his book published. And any little bit you guys could do would really help him out and help me out too because I want one of those books and it won't get published unless it reaches its goal. So make here's, it so, people. Here, here's my receipt. Yeah, awesome. Good for you. I bought one too. Um, I, I didn't realize I'd taken my credit card off of that particular PayPal account that I paid and apparently it took over two weeks for the payment to get processed. I love technology. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. Thank you. Or good, good for you, Don, for getting up there and being on Trey's show. Trey, if for those of you who don't know, Trey Ratcliffe is one of the uh, HDR gurus and photography gurus that is pretty much somebody that I think we all look at as uh, a pretty amazing photographer. And he does these variety shows very much like we have our show here on a Hangout. And they're really fun to watch. And since I love to get sidetracked, <laughs> so yeah. much. Okay, ten thirty. Exposure triangle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exposure triangle. Let's get into it, guys. <laughs> First, let's talk about the creative corner. Uh, the creative corner is our assignment, so to speak, to get you thinking about the the things we're going to teach about tonight. And uh, the assignment tonight, and I was going to see if maybe Darren wants to explain about this, but we didn't really talk about it a whole lot before the show, so. I think I'll just blab on for a couple seconds and you guys can pipe up. Um, I'm thinking extremes. I'm thinking make a photo uh, different ways. Using the aperture, try and make a photo when you're zoomed in all the way at maximum aperture. That's the biggest opening, smallest number. And then close the aperture all the way down and make the same shot. Look at the two photos and see what they look like. Uh, check out how blurry the background is and so mm -hmm. on. Um, for shutter speed, make a photo if you want. Use a tripod. It might help. Uh, try a 30 second exposure, the slowest exposure that your camera would make as an automatic setting, and then make the fastest, a 4,000th or 8,000th of a second photo. Now again, you're going to have to compensate to make the, sh the photo brighter and you know, the proper exposure. Well, you'll so, have to explain the exposure triangle before they'll figure that one out. And that's the point a, of A 30 the next second exposure <laughs> during the daytime could leave it with a, kind of a very bright looking white blob. This is the challenge. This is the challenge. This is so, the challenge. We're, we're going to give this challenge. We're going to write it back on the Google, on the YouTube um, notes as soon as the show's over so you can go back and check out the challenge rules again. And then, of course, using the ISO, make a photo where the high ISO is necessary. Um, our friend Glenn Wilcox uh, was shooting the dog jumping competitions, and he was set at 6,400 ISO, and he had to be that high of an ISO so he can get the sharpness and get the shutter speeds he needed. And again, we're going to explain a little bit more about that in a minute. But um, I'll tell you, man, that 6400 ISO, that D600 that he has, that looks so good. 
very, very clean on these new cameras. I would never have thought to go to 6400 ISO. But he did it, and it looked awesome. I'm just so, glad with my 7D, with the firmware upgrade, I can do 2000. So, you know, getting even higher than that is incredible. 2000? Did you ever do that comparison with the old firmware, new firmware? Uh, no, I haven't yet. But I haven't upgraded hers yet, so I, I should do that soon. For people that don't know what we're talking about, uh, Canon released a firmware upgrade for the 7D, which uh, brought the usable. Now, when I say usable, I mean for me shooting a wedding. I'm very particular about the, the amount of noise that I get. Uh, it brought the usable ISO from uh, 800 up to about 2,000, which is awesome. So. It is. It's so helpful. And this Saturday, I'm shooting a wrestling event up in Barrie, and uh, Power Slam Wrestling. Yeah. Uh, everybody check it out. It's super cool. I'm going to be shooting that, and it'll be fun. And I'll be hovering around 3200 ISO for pretty much the entire night because I'm in very low light. It's in a church, and I'm going to need really fast shutter speeds. And we're going to get more into that. And that, that's where we're getting into our discussion. So, um, Is it that hard, that hard to get money out of Christians that they got to wrestle it out of them now? <laughs> in the church. <laughs> <laughs> if you only knew. <laughs> I'm not going there. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> to lead us into our full disc, because we've talked about this challenge. We want you to make um, photos trying the shutter speed, trying the aperture, trying the ISO. Um, the thing that actually prompted this entire show was this email that we got from Peter in Unionville. Uh, maybe, Gabriel, you could uh, give us a quick read of that email, and we'll cover sure. what we'll all that's about. Open the door for my... You ever notice when a do cat's sitting at the door meowing to go out, you open the door, he turns around, walks away? Yeah. <sighs> okay. You know, it's funny. Side note, I don't do this ever, so I thought I'd maybe give you a quick, you know, side note. Uh, <laughs> we have collar little, with a little bell. We have collars with a little bell hanging around our doorknobs. And if Angel wants to come in and out of the room, she'll go up and she'll ring the doorbell. See, that's a good idea. Unfortunately, my cat's dumber than a bag of hammers, so <laughs> wouldn't really work. Well, she knows, too, that if you open the door, she has to come in. She actually knows that. So it's pretty funny. Anyway, Cats go, only go, want to come go. in when the door is closed. If the door is open, then they won't They don't in. want to come in. Uh, she's right. 20 years old. We've had years to train her. She's, <laughs> she's a pretty smart little girl. Anyway, sorry, Gabriel. Go ahead now. So Peter from Unionville. Hi, Peter. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Here I <is. laughs> Hey, we mean that. <laughs> he writes in, I was watching your episode on EXIF. We got a lot of feedback from that episode mm -hmm. um, on EXIF data and thought it would have been so much better if I actually knew what all those settings actually meant. He said Maybe actually you twice. Guys... It's kind of funny. I'm not going to pick on him for that. Okay, sorry. Feeling a little bit more giving than you apparently tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe My you guys bad. could do a show on exposure and what the settings mean to the end image. Well, Peter from Unionville, we're listening. We are. Here's your show. <laughs> well done. That was so well done. <laughs> I was going to go all Mr. Rogers and like, you know, here goes my tea and stuff, but no, I was going to figure out just make it short and sweet. Right over my head. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, that leads us into our discussion. Finally, after... 34 minutes, we're getting to the meat and potatoes of this episode. So we're talking about the exposure triangle. Uh, the exposure triangle is pretty much at the root of everything related to photography. Uh, the relationship of these settings is how we make an image sharper or blurrier, or how we get the background in or out of focus, or even in low light, how we can still achieve sharpness in the photos. And that's really tough, and I think that's the hardest thing that people have. When you shoot mm. low light, well, the word photography means drawing with light, photography pull the photo from the graphy, things get kind of tough, right? So I thought you were going to start rapping there. No, nah, no, nah, not this guy. <laughs> that would be scary. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the exposure triangle is step one. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of photographers will argue composition and blah, blah, blah. It's all, you know, but <clears throat> I'd say that's step two. Um, step one is learning how to take a picture that is exposed properly. And, you know, if, if, if you want to capture the motion, learning how to capture the motion. But just it, the exposure triangle is sort of photography 101. It's the first step to learning how to take better photos. And 
subsequently use your camera. Hang on, I gotta challenge you on that one. Just because I'm Darren. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I taught some <laughs> nuclear fuel rod inspectors, and they couldn't give a rat's ass about composition. To them, having it focused on the right part so that it could see and photograph and document and take it to a superior, you know, to ask, you know, is this crack, mm -hmm. you know, in the nuclear fuel rod, is mm -hmm. this important? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, so, so composition for, for some people, composition rod. really doesn't matter. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not saying composition is step two. But, he, it, but to get an in-focus picture of a nuclear fuel rod, Wow where our conversations take us, they have to properly use the exposure triangle so they don't just hand them a picture that looks like the inside of a coffin on a moonless night and say, here's a t picture I took. Is, you know, is it cracked when you know, it's just a big black square? So you know, they have to, whether the camera does it for them or even better if they understand the exposure triangle, that's how they're going to get that image. And then after that, they can say, is this cracked and heavy? Did you notice how I used the rule of thirds? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. And then well, as far as composition goes, I mean, wedding photographers don't need to know anything about composition. Mm -hmm. Just put it in the green auto mode and shoot. Right? P is for professional. Hello. <laughs> oh, oh, I thought P was for portraits. <laughs> That too, professional portraits. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's fascinating stuff, but something really cool just happened. And this is going to sidetrack us a little bit. Our buddy Anthony from the Muskoka Wildlife Center just uh, signed up on the Day Tripper Photo community. Oh. And I'd like to welcome cool. Anthony as part of our community. And in doing so, I would like to share our fun moment that we had with Anthony uh, at this last day trip. Can um, I just, uh, Anthony, yeah, Anthony is, little, some people may not know, a world championship jouster. Oh. Did I lose it? <laughs> oh, we lost Brian there for a second. Okay. Brian froze up, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he uh, just Me? came back. I'm freezing? For a second there. No, you're talking about Dale. You're talking about Dale. Dale is the oh, guy who actually led the thing. Yeah, Anthony's the right. one that oh, wore the hat. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. I got yeah. them mixed up. I thought you meant the, the guy that ran it. No, uh, but that's funny too. Dale, the guy that actually um, runs the the Muskoka Wildlife Center, is a championship jouster, which is so cool. It's kind of awesome. It's super awesome. Um, but that's not really what I'm getting at. This is, this is our friend Anthony here. You're going to recognize what I'm talking about. Boom. As long as I don't cut oh, it. right. Okay. Can you see that? Yep. There he is. So there's Anthony. His father, Rick, took this photo for us. And when we're in the cage with the wolves, um, sometimes they lay down and they get a little bit boring. So Dale, the jouster, suggested that we throw a hat in the air or maybe like a snowball in the air and attract the wolves' attention. So, you know, Anthony's like, sure, no problem. Let's, you know, attract the wolves' attention rather than have it lay down doing nothing. So he took off his hat, and you can see his hat he's wearing, and he threw it in the air. And a uh, funny thing happened <laughs> on the way to <laughs> the Muskoka Wildlife Center. Um, the wolf didn't really take too kindly to <laughs> a hat. looks like a rabbit being thrown around in front of him. So I'm trying to... <laughs> Anthony, man, we love you. This is <laughs> We're so glad you weren't killed. <laughs> there was never any danger of anybody being killed. Um, no, the, no, you would, fangs like coming to, out. you would really like to think that there was no danger. Um, now, we do have our customers sign disclaimers before going on these trips uh, for such reasons. And I think the next time we go to the Muskoka Wildlife Center, I'll be paying attention to the hats that our, our friends are wearing yeah. <laughs> a little bit closer. But, no, Anthony did nothing wrong. He did exactly what he was told to do. And it was just pretty, pretty good reaction from his father to get the photo. And what really made me laugh was when his father was talking about the image after the fact, and he says he had a choice of, um, you know, either helping Anthony or <laughs> taking the photo. <laughs> he goes, it's my son, so of course I took the photo. It was brilliant. So, yeah, you'll notice that most cameras have that little niche there, which is good for protecting your 
your throat against wolf attacks. Very Everything good. else is fine. <laughs> <laughs> I remember anyway. reading an essay uh, from a photographer. He was on a, on an airplane with his family. It was like a 737 or something like that. And, um, and they were crashing. And like one of the engines failed and they were doing an emergency landing in the water and, you know, nobody knew if they were going to be okay. And he pulled out his camera and he was taking the pictures of people's reactions on the airplane while it's crashing. So, hmm. you know, that's how you can kind of tell a real photographer is when tragedy hits, like, whoop. <laughs> do they use the exposure triangle to do that? <laughs> well, after watching our episode, they'll sure understand what to do with that because we will eventually talk about it, and I think we should start now. So, thank you, Anthony, for watching, and let's move on to the show. Uh, so, yeah, basically getting back into what is the exposure triangle. There are certain things involved in the exposure triangle. There is aperture, there is shutter speed, and there is ISO, of which we will explain momentarily. Um, and using these things in a combination of ways is how you get a certain look to your photo. Um, if you could think of the exposure triangle as, you know, each one, each part of the triangle has a separate little stick, and you can stick it in the mud. The aperture you can stick in the mud, the shutter speed, the ISO. Um, I think Gabriel has a pretty cool little graphic that can show mm -hmm. us. When you adjust one, the others have to compensate. So uh, he had a little rubber band. Oh, there's a little Darren graphic there. Pull that up. Here we go. Hmm. Um, basically, if you could take the ISO and stick it in the mud, it won't change. So the aperture and the shutter speed have to move around. If you take the aperture and the ISO and stick them both in the mud, then it's just the shutter speed that will adjust your light. So by learning how these things work together, this is how you're going to be able to keep an even exposure so everything looks the same brightness all the time, just like your pupils will open and close and let more or less light in. Um, it's a really uh, a handy way of understanding how the light is being used in your camera. So, Darren, maybe you can quickly begin by going over what aperture is all about. The the aperture is the opening in the lens, very much like the uh, pupil in your eye is that opens and closes, lets in more light or blocks the light, and that controls what's known as depth of field or the area in focus. So, in this other little graphic here, thank you to Gabriel for pointing me in that direction here. That's a great graphic. Uh, it really shows it. Mm -hmm. We're showing us these people. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, when you're watching it on the screen, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the back person is blurry at f2.8, which is an opening that's very large. It's like our pupil at night, right? Very, very open, lets in lots of light. And then at f16, they're all, all the four people, even the little kid in the back, are all in focus. So that just brought the area of focus into a larger area. Now I'm going to cut over to me for a quick second just to kind of uh, yep. elaborate a little bit more. Um, this is my Nifty 50 that I always use for demonstration. Um, this is right now, if you can see on the side of the lens, it tells you what the aperture rating is. Right here. Right now it's at f22, which is this orange spot right here, and it can go all the way open to f1.8. f22 is a very small little hole. Can you see that okay? Mm hmm And then as I open that to f1.8, the hole gets bigger and all the way open. See, it's a little bit, there we go, all the way open. And that's how we have f1.8, and then closes all the way down to f22. So there's your aperture, which does two things. It lets in more or less light, and as Darren has the graphics still up, adjusts the depth of field in the photo. Sorry, Darren, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's um, then the bottom left corner uh, is the shutter speed, and that's, uh, that's the door opens and closes and lets the light in for a certain period of time. The longer you leave the door open, uh, when you're recording light, anything that moves becomes blurry. So if you're photographing objects that move kids, you know, people's biggest number one problem is trying to get pictures of their kids inside and not have them be blurry. So they had it in focus. They focused in the right part. They had the right depth of the field, but their shutter speed was too slow, and that's how you can get a blurry photo. Now, of course, the opposite end, uh, when you block that light, when the aperture, you know, that tiny little hole that you were just showing people, if you've got that tiny little opening, well, that's not letting in a very, uh, very large amount of light, so you are going to have to keep the door open a much longer time 
to be able to record the light that is coming in. Mm -hmm. That's right, because your camera is constantly trying to make light balanced at the zero point. In the middle of the graphic you have up, there's the minus two and the plus two and that little line right in the middle. That's your light meter in your camera, basically saying that it is always trying to make sure that the light is right there at the middle, so it's not too bright, it's not too dark, it's a proper exposure. By adjusting these two things, what Darren's saying is, if the aperture is a very small little opening, the shutter speed will have to slow down to balance that light and to let the light come back into play. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way, though. So then, up at the top, the ISO sensitivity settings, uh, they're showing little light bulbs here, and that's very much like uh, the UV index would be for us in the summertime, sensitivity to light, right? The more sensitive you are to light, then the less time it takes to get a burn. Well, in photography, the more sensitive the recording surface is to light, the less time it takes to take a photo. So then that would allow you to close the aperture to make a smaller opening, but make it more sensitive to the light that's there so you don't have to keep the door open as long. Right, so that's how they all work together. Brilliant. That's a quick overview of it. But if we go into a little bit more detail, the shutter speed is basically like a cork. And some of the old cameras, they had that box. And then you just basically pull the cork out for a couple of seconds and put it back in, and that's how you made your exposure. So nowadays, they're using these really different materials. They're using, um, let's see if I can even show you what it looks like. Electronic corks. <laughs> Electronic flappy cork things. I was not familiar with the cork method. Oh, no? <laughs> yeah, back in the day, they'd have um, a little box, and you have your film on the back and then just literally have a cork in the front, and then you pull that cork out, the light goes in, exposes the light on the scent, on the film, and you put the cork back in when your exposure's done. I didn't realize you were that much older than I was. I did a show with Ross <laughs> called Day Tripper Television. And I thought it was to take the cork out of the wine bottle while you're waiting for it to expose the, the <laughs> no, light, and you that, put the cork back in the wine bottle, you're done. <laughs> that's built-in stabilization. Okay. <laughs> so if you look on, the, on Mr. Snaps here, um, when I take a picture... Oh, yeah, let's try a slower shutter. <laughs> you heard that, but of course that was at 6400th of a second. And let's um, let everybody know that Brian is going to get oodles of dust on his sensor by doing this, so do not do this at home to have a look inside your camera to see what it looks like. No, Good point. please don't. Thank you for saying <laughs> Mr. Snaps is a hardy little bugger, and I like to clean him often. So, Okay, so here you go. See how that stayed open for a second? Well, not quite a second. All we can see is the reflection of your webcam. You need to go into the manual exposure mode, put it on bulb mode. Yeah, bulb would probably be the best. I'm just going for a slow shutter, but I'll put it to bulb. Bulb sh shutter is one second slower than 30 seconds. So if I hold the shutter down, there's my sensor. Hello, sensor. So Hi, sensor. Hello, sensor. <laughs> sensor sees my webcam, and then as soon as I release the shutter... <laughs> Oh, that's not friendly. <laughs> no, Those no, sensors were no, hard during the making of this show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I have the tools and I have the power to clean this sensor. So have no fear. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. The shutter opens and closes and exposes the sensor to light. And the amount of time the shutter opens, the shutter speed. The longer it stays open, the slower the exposure and the faster, the faster the shutter. So when the shutter opens and closes very quickly, you end up with a very sharp image. And if, the op if it opens and closes very slowly, unless your camera is stabilized, it'll move. And if it moves, then light will stream across that sensor and create the blur that we all see and love when we take pictures of our kids or our dog or anything running around in low light. Or Can, can I show a really high-tech graphic. Of course. This is a really high-tech graphic. I mean, it took me hours to, to make this up. So this piece of paper here, <laughs> and the line up here at the top, and then the line down here at the bottom, this is the shutter speed range that your camera has. So the average camera has one four thousandth of a second all the way down to 30 seconds. So when you're in any of these automatic or semi-automatic modes, this is the range of shutter speeds that the camera has to automatically go in and pick and choose. However, the amount of light coming in through the aperture in order to get the correct exposure would be about the thickness of my finger. 
in comparison to where all of the ranges of shutter speeds are. So what a lot of people don't realize is, well, why can't I use a four thousandth of a second to freeze the action inside my house at night? Right? So at night you're down in the lower section and the aperture ranges, you know, where my finger are, are you know, getting down there. So then the other variable is the sensitivity to light, which basically is just moving where these aperture ranges will be to get you that correct exposure. Mm -hmm. Does that help make sense in a graphical way? I don't know, Gabriel, can you <laughs> Google something like this? <laughs> a piece of paper, Google. No, that's good. So, yeah, that, that's great. Um, if I were to give a quick example here, so this is a picture that I took of a waterfall. Um, if I had taken this at one four thousandth of a second, you would be able to see each individual drop you know, falling down the waterfall. Um, if I wanted to get a shallow depth of field, I could shoot this at 2.8 2 uh, with a really fast shutter speed, but I didn't want to do that. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to extend it as long as possible. So for that, if we go into our photo details, ah, oh, there it is. I forgot I put the uh, geotag data on there. I had a, fr a friend asking where I took that the other day. Um, yeah, I love G plus. Yeah, I love Google Plus. <laughs> so I wanted to take this and long for for a long time. I wanted the exposure, the the sorry, the shutter speed to be very very slow. So I set it for five seconds at f twenty two. I think I also had a neutral density filter on here, so that was able that allowed me to shoot longer without it overexposing. But at f twenty two, that slowed it. That made things dark enough that I could shoot longer and not have it be overexposed. So the way I always explain it, when you think of the exposure triangle, don't think of a static triangle like that it, it's as good a triangle as I can do. Think of it, and I always use an elastic band for this because I find it works out the best. Think of it as um, a triangle like this that when you move one corner, other corners automatically move. Uh, photography, especially the exposure triangle, is is all about give and take. It's about it's about um, um, compromises. So uh, pretty much everything in photography is about compromises, and the exposure triangle is is no different. So mm -hmm. if this is your aperture and this is your shutter speed and this is your ISO, and we'll get into ISO in a second. These are the two that move the most. Um, if you change your aperture your shutter speed is going to change. If you change your shutter speed, your aperture... So if you have a, a picture that is perfectly exposed, but you want a shallower depth of field, if you want a shallower depth of field, so you change your aperture, then your either your ISO or your shutter speed has to change to maintain that perfect exposure. So I always think of the triangle as something that moves around constantly. And... Mm -hmm you have to give up on one corner to be able to get what you want with the other corner. I think to properly explore, to further explain that, because that was a perfect uh, explanation, is to talk about what is shutter speed. Like, why do you need a faster shutter speed? So, again, we talked about how when you have a slow shutter, there's motion. So, like, you took that photo of the waterfall for a five-second exposure. Usually for that milky-looking water, you want to go, you know, five, ten, maybe even longer than mm -hmm. that for shutter speed. Uh, if you want to, you know, just do a still subject. If you have like something sitting on the counter and you're just taking a picture and you're sitting here, a sixtieth of a second. Uh, somebody walking, maybe one hundred twenty-fifth of a second. Uh, somebody running, two hundred fiftieth of a second. Uh, if you're trying to do splashes or like really high-speed photography, you're going. And um, when we're comparing that shutter speed to what your lens is going to do, well, the farther your lens zooms out the faster your shutter speed needs to be to compensate for that because that's going to magnify your own shake. Now, a lot of people come in the store, they've taken pictures with their point-and-shoot cameras, and they realize that they're blurry because they're indoors or whatever, and they show me the photo, and I, I hit the exit information, and it says one-tenth of a second, and I'll be like, well, no wonder it's not in focus or no wonder it's blurry because you moved. Like, no, 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 no. I kept really still. So I'm sorry. If your heart is beating... If you're alive, you're moving. <laughs> a tenth of a second will not work if you're hand holding that camera and you're breathing. Now, zombies, Anthony, you know, if Anthony is in zombie form, 
Um, and I'll have to talk about that too because you know I met Anthony at the Toronto Zombie Walk and I got a great photo of him which I'm going to share in a second. Um, that I needed a very fast shutter speed for, so that might actually work for our conversation. Um, unless you're a zombie, which is why I talked about Anthony, uh, <laughs> you're going to need to have some sort of decent shutter speed to compensate for your own motion, your own blur. Mm -hmm. So something to think about is in order to achieve a specific shutter speed, you have to be able to fluctuate and change your other settings. Darren, what have you got up there? Oh, there's uh, just a couple of photos that I happened to find really quickly of um, Ragged Falls, something that people will be getting a chance to shoot on the Algonquin trip. And this is using the faster shutter speed to try to freeze the action of water. This is the shot that everybody knows and everybody gets. This is the one that if you can pre-visualize or know that just by playing around with his exposure triangle. And the only two things I got played around with here were the shutter speed and the aperture. Uh, I believe I was using a neutral density filter to be able to do this, uh, just to be able to get within the parameters to get that uh, flowing water to be milky. Uh, as Gabriel said, you have to do something that's going to block the amount of light that's there. So really it's like a pair of sunglasses or a way to make the aperture even smaller than the the camera can physically have the ability to, to do. So just, it's almost you know, like going it, negative ISO. <clears throat> it's making yeah. your, your sensor less sensitive. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, if you, could, if you could make the sensor really not sensitive, you know, an ISO of 1 as opposed to ISO of 200. Right. And yeah. um, I guess... Do we want to talk about what a stop is, just to put this all in concept of if you have the right exposure, how can you figure out what you can do? Absolutely. Go right ahead. Because uh, just about everybody's camera, digital SLR camera, and even the point-and-shoot cameras, are divided up into third stop settings. So that means anytime you're adjusting any one of these settings, you're adjusting it by one-third of a stop. So if you did it three little notches, or three presses of the button on your point-and-shoot camera, you'd be changing it effectively by a full stop. So point and 0.3, the, point 0.7, and 1. That's right. And using exposure compensation, people may have seen that. The difference in a stop is that it doubles or it halves whatever it is that you're working on. So it happens to be in shutter speed, and shutter speeds are really easy to figure out. Uh, the only exception is, and somebody will have to do some research on this one day to find out why, but at 120, 25th of a second doesn't quite line up because uh, 60 to 125 is not double, it's a little bit more. Hmm. But if you go backwards from 60 and you go down to a 30th of a second, it'll be three clicks and half of 60 is 30. And if you go from 30 to 15, half of you know 30 is 15, so not the three clicks to get you there. Uh, same idea with the ISO range, the difference between 100 and 200 would be a full stop. So if I wanted to change my ISO by a full stop and keep the brightness the same, well, I've got to change one of those other two settings by three clicks. Very good so when you're, to about it. So when you're working on all this, if you just have a way of, I've got to try to keep all this in balance, and if you don't understand what the balance is and you just understand, you know, a little bit, well, if I change this thing by, you know, this one's in full stops, this one's in third stops. So if I change this to full stop, then to keep the same setting, I've got to be able to change this one by you know, the three little clicks on my dial. And sometimes that just, you know, helps people figure it out, especially if they're shooting in the manual exposure mode. Mm -hmm. If you see uh, in your viewfinder on the back of your camera, you'll see something that looks like this. Yeah, blarg. I shut that off on mine. Mine will keep up there until, I, my, cat, until my battery dies. There you go. So each one of those little notches is a stop. There you go. And so you can you can go up by increments or by entire entire stops. So, so you if make, you're wondering, sorry, no, no, go ahead. I was just gonna just so you, if you're wondering where where you can find out what a stop is, um, when you're metering for a picture, your camera will always try if it's in an auto mode, it'll always try and put it right in the middle, um, and then you can go into uh, and, and then you can over or under expose or adjust your exposure triangle to make it go up or down uh, mm -hmm. in, in an increment of stops. So, so far we've talked about aperture. And aperture is like on that little lens I have on my camera right now. 
the more open it is, the more light can get in, and the more closed it is, the less light can get in. Mm -hmm. Plus, it's also adjusting your depth of field, so the background will be more or less in focus. Um, we've talked about shutter speed, how you need a specific shutter speed to stop your heartbeat and to stop your own shake, and also to stop the shake on the other side of the camera. Um, and I mentioned this photo a second ago, so I'll pull this up now to kind of you know show what I'm talking about. <laughs> Here's Anthony, uh, the first time I met him at the Toronto Zombie Walk. And um, my favorite photo, I posted this up on Facebook. He said, hey, that's me. And I said, awesome. So that's how we connected. Um, and since then, now he's come on the Muskoka trip, scaring our wolves. <laughs> but this shot was taken with a 50 millimeter prime lens, shot at f1.8, and that's why the background is so blurry. Plus, he's very close to the camera, and proximity also tries to help with that. Um, I needed a fast enough shutter speed so that he wasn't just a blur. So I needed to raise my ISO. So my ISO is, I think, on this photo about 1600. It wasn't the brightest, sunniest day. Um, and at f1.8, I was able to get the shutter speed I needed to stop his motion as he came. Um, at the camera like that. So because I was able to use and understand the exposure triangle, I was able to make a photo mm -hmm. on the fly with a very simple lens. So that's a really cool thing too. Now that leads us to the third part of the exposure triangle. And mm -hmm. if we haven't covered those two things enough guys who are watching, just let us know. Post your comments and we will get right to it. Um, we'll, we'll do a recap at the end too, just to boil yeah. it all down. Absolutely. Uh, da, 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 da. Now, Ron asked a question that we're going to get to as well. Uh, Ron asked a question about how does ISO on DSLR compare to the film days? I never, um, sorry, I recall never going over 400 ASA. Now cameras are so sensitive. Any examples of some high ISO and noise it has? All cameras have the same noise at, at the same ISO. No, actually. All cameras are a little bit different. And the size mm. of the sensor has a lot to do with that. The processors in your cameras, the number of pixels on the sensor, because when a pixel is smaller, it won't soak up the same kind of light. It won't be able to absorb that, so your ISO mm -hmm. will get a bit grainier. The uh, firmware. Is, um, with, with my 7D, I've got two 7Ds. One's updated to the latest firmware, and one's on the older firmware. And shooting two pictures at ISO 800, there's noticeable differences in the ISO because the firmware processes the image differently. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's all processing, right? Computer digital technology can clean up this grain quite well. But first, let's explain. ISO is basically uh, the sensitivity of your image sensor to light. It used to be the sensitivity of your film. It used to be called ASA. Now it's ISO. Organization, same thing you see up on the side of those factory buildings, ISO 9000 and so on. Um, has nothing to do with what it is, but that's what they call it. Uh, so if you think of your skin, um, I have psoriasis. My skin gets very sensitive to the light. So I have a very high ISO. I'm extremely sensitive to that light. Um, Gabriel, do you tan or do you burn? Uh, I have a lot of Indian blood in me, so I tan. Excellent. So you're insensitive to light. You have low mm -hmm. ISO. So let's say Gabriel is... My right. wife is Scottish, so she gets the Scottish tan. She walks outside, and she's burnt. <laughs> <laughs> so it's exactly the thing, though. I mean, the high ISO, you get burnt very quickly. Your shutter speeds can be very quick. A low ISO takes you a while. Shutter speed slows down. You can think of it mm -hmm. the exact same way. Um, so I actually have a few images here that I'll share that... A, represent why you need to have a higher ISO, and then B, will show the grain that it, that it actually is. This is an image I shot at 6400 ISO at a wrestling event. Um, this is actually the same place where I'll be going back to on Saturday, so I'm going to have to deal with these high ISO situations again. Um, you can see there's sharpness. There's not motion blur too much in the shot, um, but it's kind of faded. It doesn't look really popping out with color and it's not tack tack sharp. Well, at 6400 ISO, the picture gets quite grainy. And if I were to go to the same image that I made, but I've zoomed into it at 100%, uh, let me just pull this up here, you'll see the difference that this makes. And you're not going to notice it too much on the wide shot, but that's why I have the one zoomed into 100%. And I don't know if this is clear for everybody, but it's quite a bit hmm. grainier. Uh, probably difficult to see through a web a web situation like this. If they look but, in uh, the, uh, the, the shadow by the hand, you can see a lot of the grain mm -hmm. there. Yes, and also you can see a little bit of the texture. Um, and that's at ISO 6400? Yes. 
Well, very interesting because on this photo I have here of you on the bus going up to Algonquin last year, this is at only ISO 3200. And if I zoom in on this, this does not look nearly as nice as your shot mm -hmm. does. So which and camera that, took this? This was my little Canon pocket point and shoot. Oh. Well, that might explain it. Mm -hmm. So bumping down the sensitivity down to 400, it got less grainy. But then I'm not... If you look through the window of the bus, you really can't see anything of what's going on on the road. And on this one, we can see the headlights of the bus shining on the road. We can see more detail in the ambient light. Now, the camera flash was used, which is why we're getting all of this. Mm -hmm. So the size size matters. Ladies the size of the sensor and the size, yeah, for sure. So if you take... Um, whoops. This is a picture that I took with my camera phone the other day and talk about tiny little <laughs> sensor... Whoops. Why isn't this going... There we go. <laughs> so this is uh, Sword Spider-Man. So <laughs> Sword Spider-Man and Mr. Dad. Robot. <laughs> you are oh, look, and we know where you live now. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. Everybody knows where I live. Um, I don't even know where you live. <laughs> so um, this is uh, ISO 700, which on my 7D would be perfectly acceptable, but because it's right. on a tiny little, um, you know, a tiny little camera, tiny little sensor, and this was actually with the front, the uh, the front sensor uh, on, on the, the, sorry, the front camera on the phone, um, you can see, I mean, there's a lot of grain, and it, it just does not look like a good image. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a huge difference there. And this is a big reason why I bought Mr. Snaps. Because now we're talking about a full-frame digital SLR with only 12 megapixels. So fewer pixels on a smaller surface means bigger pixels. Mm -hmm. Bigger pixels means cleaner, high ISO. Until recently, because some of these photos that I've been seeing some people post, and I made a mention earlier about some of the pictures that uh, Denis posted, and I will... Actually, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't even Denis, it was Glenn. My mistake. I um, don't know why I said that, but... I'm correcting myself. So here is a shot that Glenn made that I love, and I'm going to share this with everybody. And this is his new Nikon D600. And uh, as you can see through the EXIF information, it's at 6400 ISO. And I'm going to see if I can zoom into that. How do you zoom into that? Oh, here we go. It's, yeah. There we are. So I zoomed in, and you can see the little dog stuck in midair. <laughs> At 6400 ISO, this is incredibly clean. Yeah. And the sensor's the same size as my camera, but it has twice as many pixels. So now we've got processors in these cameras really cleaning up that grain and doing a great job to maintain that clarity. So thank you so much, uh, Glenn, for posting those on our site. And we, I mean, just it's a really good example, and it gets me excited about the new camera that I'm getting soon. Now, but with that comes comes across as well because my 7D is much lower megapixel but I can shoot 8 frames per second whereas the D800 is you know fantastically great megapixel full frame but it's it's what 3 4 frames per second on a good day on a good so so yes there's there's like with everything every photography is is an art of compromise uh, yeah. just about every single aspect of photography you're compromising something you just have to you know, figure out what you want to compromise that day. So you can get super high megapixels, lower shutter speed, um, or uh, sorry, lower you know, frames per second, or less uh, megapixels, not full frame, eight frames per second. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so excited about the 7100 D7100 Nikon that I'm going to be picking up, hopefully any day. Um, we're talking about now 24 megapixels, and in the 1.3 crop. DX mode, it's 15 megapixels, 7 frames per second, mm -hmm. and uh, all that other juicy goodness that Nikon has to put in there. So I, oh. Sorry, giddy, giddy. <laughs> I know, I'm not replacing Mr. Snaps, don't worry, nobody freak out. Mr. Snaps is going to not end up in the garbage or the dump or anything. This is my specific camera, landscapes, um, outside shots. He's going to sit in the corner collecting dust 
because you're not going to no. want to use it again. <laughs> you know, it'll be interesting um, for Saturday. If I have the camera by then, then um, I might use that for wrestling. But usually this would be the wrestling camera for mm. sure because of that high ISO. I'll put it through the pace. You'll use Mrs. Soon. Snaps. Mrs. Snaps. <laughs> <laughs> you know, put them in the bag together and little tiny Nikons will come walking out. <laughs> <laughs> they'll grow point and shoots. <laughs> Uh, well, the the search is on for a name for the new camera, so I'll have to see how that goes. <laughs> anyway, um, that's pretty much the exposure triangle. There's aperture, there's shutter speed, and there's ISO. And learning how to use those things together is what makes your photo look unique. Um, I don't know if there's too much too much else to really get into a whole lot there. What do you think, guys? Um, a, a lot of it is is just experimentation, and. Um, like we said in the creative corner, take a picture, uh, and what I would even say is is take a picture um, on manual mode um, at the uh, widest aperture, and then take the and then set it to the the smallest aperture, and take the exact same picture without adjusting anything else, and and see what happens, and then figure out what you have to do to the other settings to get it to the same exposure. Um, and it really helps you create an understanding of what's going on in your camera. And it's funny because some people will use aperture priority mode mm -hmm. to control their shutter speed. And if you think about it for a second, it makes perfect sense that if I'm opening up the opening and letting in lots of light, as much light as I can let in, well, then the camera's going to use the fastest shutter speed that it can. I'm really and glad if you I want to use a, if I want to use a slow shutter speed, then I just squint the camera down so it's not letting in as much light, mm -hmm. and the camera's going to have to use a slower shutter speed. Actually, that's exactly how I, I generally shoot wrestling, unless I'm using uh, flash, then I'll go into manual. Uh, I know Brian Watts always shoots in manual when he shoots, but uh, for me, I prefer aperture priority. Crank open the aperture. Nikon has a great auto ISO feature, so I can literally tell my camera, I give you the permission, Mr. Snaps you are allowed to shoot up to 3200 ISO and at least give me 320th of a second shutter speed. So you can tell it, I need this shutter speed, mm -hmm. and it will automatically bounce the ISO around depending on how much light is shining into the camera. So that's well, then a you're going to love Mr. Snippy Snaps because Mr. Snippy Snaps is going to have the programmable auto ISO, but it's going to raise the ISO based on the zoom setting of your lens. Right. So the more you zoom in, the more it's going to raise the ISO to get a faster shutter speed. Which is awesome. And with <laughs> the reason that's important is because, like I mentioned a few seconds ago, the longer your focal length, the faster your shutter speed needs to be. We mm -hmm. talked about this in Muskoka. If you're shooting at 300 millimeters and taking a picture of something that is static, like this freaky-looking um, candle holder thingy, put that there. Uh, if I'm at 300 <laughs> millimeters and I'm taking a picture of that, it's not moving. It's sitting there. But my heart's beating, so I have to make sure I have at least the 300th of a second shutter speed, unless I'm on a tripod. Different story. But if I'm taking a picture of a wolf that's running, now we've got to talk about three times that number. So instead of it being a 300th of a second shutter now, it has to be a 900th at least, or a 1,000th, or faster if you can. Um, so and that, that never used to be as important if you're only printing, you know, a 4 by 6 inch print, or you're... You know, you don't have the, the newest, latest, sharpest lens or sharpest camera, but as soon as you get the sharpest camera and the sharpest lens, all these little things that didn't go right suddenly become magnified now. Mm -hmm. And I, I never realized that until I started shooting some action with, you know, a fast lens, a really good lens and a really good camera. And then I zoomed in on them, and then I noticed, you know, I didn't focus in the right spot or my shutter speed was too low, mm -hmm. right? Because now the whole picture's blurry because I was jiggling the camera and the stabilizing system uh, either was switched off or didn't kick in. Mm -hmm. So Actually, just, you know, knowing, know, knowing these things, you know, going in to shoot at the faster shutter speed. Mm -hmm. But you, you also have to remember to put your settings back. Ah, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I've never gone day, to shoot the front of a house at ISO 3200. I've never done that. <laughs> <laughs> The other day, I was uh, driving around with Shelly, and we just happened to pull over to the side of the road because we saw these ducks in the water. And I had Mr. Snaps, and I actually had the 50 mil lens on, that I have on there now uh, on backwards with my reversing ring. <laughs> so seeing ducks in a 50 mil lens that's on backwards isn't going to be very easy to get a, a good photo. So I grabbed Mr. Snaps, and I flipped the lens around, and I ran outside. I, I talked 
back about 30 second Kestrel photo when I got this picture of the hawk out in the backyard and it only took me 30 seconds to make all these proper choices and be so smart. Well, I just proved that I have a long way to go still. <laughs> and I was able to uh, get a shot, but it was, I mean, this is edited here and it's fixed like exposure like mad, brought it way down. But I was at 1600 ISO and I was at F1.8 and, <laughs> you know, outside on a fairly decent weather day, everything was white. And of course, I'm looking on the back of the camera thinking, this is toast. But sure enough, I shoot in raw, so I was able to pull down the exposure so you can actually make out that they're birds. But with a 50 mil lens, you're not going to see much more than that. Anyway, long story short, put your settings back or else uh, you might end up blowing out your shots really badly, especially mm -hmm. with the ISO. Yeah, I had that okay. this summer. Uh, sorry, this winter. I just I pulled over on the side of the road and took a bunch of pictures of this. It had just finished snowing and there was cool snow formations and stuff. I took about ten minutes worth of uh, of photos. Popped back in the car and just did a quick review and realized I was on ISO two thousand from something <laughs> I did previously. It's like format card, fix ISO, go back and shoot everything all over again. <laughs> oh, God. Well, at least you were able to do that. By the, yeah. time I was, by the time I even walked close to those ducks, they were gone, so skittish. I thought about following them, but Shelly was waiting in the car, and she probably wouldn't have liked that too much. <laughs> I, I had that happen the other day. I was shooting the outside of this house, and I was using the exposure compensation, and then I put it in a manual exposure mode, and I couldn't figure out why the photo wouldn't get any darker. ISO 3200. Yeah. Check that and I went, oh, okay, that's why. <laughs> that's actually Oops. a really good point. You're going to notice sometimes when your ISO is too high, your shutter will peak. And it won't, like a lot of cameras, like Darren said, will only go to a four thousandth of a second. And mm -hmm. if you're shooting with an aperture that's open and your sensitivity is extremely high, your shutter won't go fast enough to compensate for that to come back. So. Canon, um, bl Canon blinks at you if the setting is not correct for the exposure. Canon will blink, and Nikon's will say high or low. High. I high thought, or low, I thought my, my Nikon at work was just really friendly. Hi. Hi. Okay, take the picture now. Hi. No, no, thank you. Hi, take the picture. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that could be a problem. You wouldn't want that. Um, now, what is this Sunny 16 rule? Darren, do you know anything about the Sunny 16 rule? Now, here's why I asked. My little brother and I were talking about our show tonight. My little brother, Rick, uh, he's not that little. He's actually <laughs> pretty much taller than me now. Um, and he, base, he he mentioned this talk about the Sunny 16 rule. And in the same breath, he also suggests that even though high shutter speeds of current cameras have made it nearly irrelevant, I think it's still worth talking about, though. Are you familiar with the Sunny 16 rule? I am with familiar with it a little bit, but you got to be careful because stopping down to f16 if you don't need it is going to make your pictures less sharp. Mm -hmm. So this more aperture to make you know pictures better is actually making a lot of photos worth uh, worse. Uh, so you know it, it's worth to know the sunny 16 rule you know for film cameras. Uh, in those days there wasn't as much automation. So on a sunny day you set the aperture to 16 and then your uh, shutter speed, is the factor of whatever your ISO is. So if you're using ISO 400, a four hundredth of a second. Using ISO 100, one hundredth of a second. So it's just a quick way to set up your camera and know you're going to have fairly decent exposure. And like you said, this is something that they use mainly in film days, but it still kind of holds true if you set your camera to those settings. And But then again, mm -hmm. we're not going to be putting it to 3200 ISO, not on purpose at least. The, the, the nice thing about understanding the exposure triangle, and I was listening to a photographer being interviewed the other day, especially with digital nowadays, you should have your exposure locked in within three, three shots. So if you know your exposure triangle uh, and, and you know what effect you're trying to get, you can walk into a room, set it, and pretty much be bang on because you shoot it in raw. If you don't get the first shot, you, you can still recover from it. Um, but while you're learning the exposure triangle, take your first shot, take a look at it, see what you don't like about it, adjust your settings, and within three pictures, you should have a perfectly balanced exposure. Uh-huh. Now, I always like to leave on my little camera blinkies, and that's mm -hmm. letting me know that I'm not getting any detail in this part of my desk lamp that I just shot. So mm -hmm. if I'm shooting a room, then I don't need to see detail inside the light bulb. Mm -hmm. right? But if this is a bride and this is the wedding dress of the bride that's flashing, then that's very important to know that I haven't got any detail. 
So I, right. I like I like finding that setting in the camera uh, when I'm doing things like that, and especially if I'm photographing things that are white, where I need to see the detail in the white objects. Absolutely. Canon, um, fortunately, also has an underexposure warning that will also blink areas in blue. Uh, Nikon doesn't have that. <laughs> And we talked last week about how some cameras will have focus peaking, which kind of highlight the focus points on, on your image as well. So there's all these settings that your camera can show you and, and give you little tips to let you know if you have the proper exposure. And the highlight exposure tool is definitely something that a lot of us use. Uh, Denis, Den sorry, were you going to say something else? No, I was just going to say it, 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 it makes a strong uh, argument for RTFM, read the full manual. Um, but... Uh, even if you read the full manual with firmware updates and stuff, it's always adding new new features. I it just on on last week's show, you know, Navi, who is one of the more accomplished photographers that I know, I heard her saying, "Oh yeah, I had no idea my Nikon had this feature," you know, and she she was just talking to somebody. So you know, really research the gear that you have because your gear can do a lot more than you think it can, and your gear can help you out a lot more than you think it can. Um, to, to really understand in the exposure triangle. Sorry, Actually, did you hear something else that Navi said? You know, she still shoots film. Yeah, well, yeah, nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> she may be beautiful and intelligent, but, you know, you can be wrong in some places. Okay. <laughs> no, I love film. I mean, no, I don't love film. I've shot with film once, and it was a disastrous experience. Um, and I have uh, admiration and confusion for people that still do it. It's I'm bringing look. film. I'm bringing film to Algonquin. Oh, excellent! <laughs> you know, I'd like to bring my uh, my Lubitel. I might do that, or even my Zeiss. I don't use them often enough, and I know I, I've always said that I don't shoot film um, cameras, and I want to get more use out of them. I just feel that when you're teaching, you don't have the time to set things up like that. You're you're kind of at the beck and call of all the the clients who are on the day. Mm -hmm. So I, I try not to. Two, she shoots medium format film. So, I mean, there's a big difference between, you know, my, my camera is less than 35 millimeter. Your camera is 35 millimeter. So, you know, my camera is like that. Your camera is like that. She's shooting. So, you know, like, you know, when she's talking about her Costa Rica picture, she's shooting with a sensor that's four times the size of a full frame camera. Yeah, you're going to get a lot more detail. And I would, I would go to film to take images like that because... They're not going to be comparable in quality, but it's 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 kind oh, of oh yes, yes they will. If you have if you have hundred. all the other factors, then it makes a difference, right? Yeah. You got to have the right lighting, the right composition, and the right technical settings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. Uh, there are some subtle differences, and you usually notice it in texture and in um, whites. The differences between whites, uh, some medium format cameras can pick up the subtle details in whites like a, a bride wearing a white dress against a, a window that has white mm -hmm. curtains. You can really see the difference between film and digital, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the digital image isn't as stunning. It just has, there's a difference, that's all. Right. Uh, Denis mentions that uh, he can do a setup shot in aperture priority, and um, he'll use his ISO to bring up the shutter speed. And, and you know, this is exactly what I do when I'm shooting wrestling. Uh, when I first show up, I'll usually take a few sample shots and check out my settings. I'll, I'll put on aperture priority. I'll crank open the aperture to the brightest that my lens will allow, which is usually a 24-70 f2.8. And then um, so until I'm getting the shutter speeds that I need. And then for the rest of the night, I'll just kind of hover on those settings, and that usually mm -hmm. works out well. Um, hopefully Saturday I'll be using a lot of flash. That's part of my new purchase kit as well, some flash. That was the other thing that, that, that got me with film. I, when I bought my one roll of film for $37 or whatever it was, and you know, you're know you looking at the roll of film, and it says ISO 300. or I, I, no, it was, I think it was ISO 100. It was black and white. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, ISO 100? Hold it. This is fixed ISO? <laughs> <laughs> Just the idea, because I, I grew up with digital, right? It's like, oh, well, we're not getting the shot we want. Crank up the ISO. The, the, the idea idea of fixed ISO, you are fixed at this ISO for the next 32 images or, or whatever. And I took a month to take that whole roll of films. You had to make sure that you were standing in the right place. And, and I, it's, that's, I, Shut I, up, you're I, making me feel old. 
<laughs> and, you know, and that being said, oh, some people would push their ISO as well. I mean, you put a 400 ISO film in there and you shoot a 200 ISO setting on your camera and you're going to get a completely different result. So a lot of folks right. when they shot with film, they would actually oh, yeah, push the ISO. Dilute the developer, lower temperature, ways to coax you know, the, the film to higher ISO values with, you know, less graininess. I just, I mean, I'm thinking just that wedding that I just shot, you know, for so for half the time there, there are a couple standing in, 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 in the early morning in front of uh, the whole, the whole room was surrounded by windows. So there are a couple standing in front of bright windows. So we had to put on spot metering so we could meter them properly. Um, but then, you know, going from there to shooting outdoors to shooting in the dark area, I mean, that that, that would be seven rolls of film because I would just, you know, you'd be having to you know, either mash your camera settings the whole time to, to dial it in or change your ISOs. So weddings, weddings definitely got easier to shoot with digital. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and I, that's really what photography has become for a lot of people is the convenience factor. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, what's this? Blake has a comment. Uh, he shot film when he was younger. But, uh, da -da 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 -da, of course, I have to move this now. Didn't help. I can't read off to the side. My camera's in the way. But used to used auto a lot. Oh, I see. His dad was a photographer, so he got film uh, here and there. Okay, well, Blake. You know hmm. Stop making me read around my webcam. <laughs> um, all right, so lots of cool things got, we've talked about today. The exposure triangle is something that everybody should understand more of. And uh, get out there and make your images for our challenge. Remember, the aperture. You want to zoom in all the way with your camera. Take one wide open and one closed all the way down. See the difference you get in the look of the photo. Shutter speed. Uh, try fast shutter speed, try slow shutter speed, and try and balance the light equally so that your pictures still look good at every setting. And with your mm -hmm. ISO, try a high ISO photo, try a low ISO photo, and, and compare the grain difference and the detail and the color. And this is really going to help you understand how these settings are going to help you. And again, it's about building up that database of experience. Mm -hmm. You know, try different things and, and try different settings. Um, I'm going to give a quick tip. Uh, my tip of the week will be to think again, I talked about it a minute ago, to think about the exposure triangle as having three separate branches and the fact that you can stick one in the mud. So if you're an aperture priority, you choose F28, that, that branch of the exposure triangle is stuck in the mud and it won't move. What else will be changing? You have your ISO and you have your shutter speed. So if your aperture isn't open enough and you need a faster shutter speed because it's too much motion, raise the ISO. Learn how these things work together. That is such a huge asset. Now, if you're using flash, a lot of these things don't really fall into place. You don't have to worry too much as, or as much about it. But, uh, yeah. Well, then you're turning the triangle into a square because you've got a fourth variable. You've got mm -hmm. adjustable lighting. Very, very nice. Very nice. Oh, and Blake reminded me, thank you so much for this. Um, there are some prizes that I've been talking about handing out for a while. Um, Nick Software... And here is the Pro Sharpener software. Um, there's Pro Sharpener and Define Tool. And this one is actually going to Blake. Thank you very much for you know contributing as much as you do to Date Tripper Photo. Uh, Pro Sharpener Pro uh, 3.0 is going to you, Blake. And to our good friend uh, Glenn, you're going to be picking up a copy of the Define Tool. So it'll help you get rid of some of that noise that you may not like. Actually, they're picking up the entire Nick collection because mm -hmm. when they install that software, they're eligible for the free upgrade. Help out my people. So, guys, <laughs> I will get these softwares to you as soon as I see you next. And uh, if you'd like to set up a time to come pick that up from me, just make sure you let me know. And I will meet you at Henry's in Newmarket, and I'll hand that right over to you. Unless you come to our Algonquin day trip, which Blake is coming on. And uh, I'm going to talk to Glenn. Maybe he's coming too. Anyway, <laughs> so, I like your idea of the challenge of putting the camera in aperture priority mode because that's probably the easiest one to understand and still get a good exposure. And just crank the, the aperture all the way one end, all the way the other end, see what it does to the photos. And then start yanking around the, the ISO setting. You know, and do the same thing with, you know, the aperture at one end and the ISO cranked and the ISO down and the aperture at the other end mm -hmm. and up and down. You know, just get a feeling for what it can do. 
Most exactly. of the photographers that I know shoot in aperture mode because aperture mode is the the mode with the most creativity. Um, you know, shutter speed. You can create long or short exposure, but usually you want a short exposure because you want to capture the action. Um, so your aperture is going to dictate your depth of field, and that's where most of the creativity comes in. So the photographers I know that don't shoot on manual almost always shoot on aperture priority. Because then you're just choosing the look of the photo, and mm -hmm. the shutter speed and the ISO will balance the light for you. When I'm shooting a wedding, I'm on aperture almost the entire wedding except for the first kiss, and I spend the whole do you blah 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 nailing down my settings. And then when it comes to the first kiss, I go to full manual because I don't trust the camera a hundred percent, and and so that's sort of the one image that you have to have to have to get. Uh, so I go full manual for that, and then when I'm done, I'm back to aperture. Excellent. Um, the show is starting to wind down, everybody, so if you have your questions, please get them on in here to us. Um, Denise says, that is why you use a light meter. It will show you the range you can use to get the perfect exposure better than in the camera light meter. It works for digital or film. Now, that is true, but there's... See, getting into light meters is getting into a whole different story. Are we talking incident? Are we talking reflective? What are you shooting? Um, usually light meters are best used in a studio situation, but you could use them in any situation, and you can meter light coming from the top or the bottom. But ultimately, the meters and cameras these days do work really, really well when you're shooting on the fly and uh, you're outside or you're, you're kind of running around shooting. A little tough to use a meter for all that, but it's definitely still something you can play around with. Mm -hmm. Um... So let's let's just refresh the exposure triangle, right? <laughs> the ISO is at the nose, right? That's the sensitivity side, right? And then down at the bottom, the shutter, the feet, the speed, the motion, and then the aperture. Well, <laughs> we'll just leave that to your imagination. <laughs> did you intend on that? <laughs> Gosh, yes, Joseph I did. better not be watching this show. <laughs> he loves the aperture. Anyway, and then lovely note. Thank you, Darren. <laughs> That's the Briangle for you. Um, <laughs> More Bri, bri than you ever wanted. Oh, that's quite the angle. <laughs> is that the angle of reflectance? What is that? Anyway, um, for those of you who want to actually come along on a day trip with us now, <laughs> the next big day trip we have it coming up will be going to Algonquin Park. We do have some night photography. I believe it's April 19th. We're going to be doing our next night photography class. Um, but Algonquin Park is going to be the mobile classroom where you actually come with us. We teach you on the way, as you saw the photo that Darren shared there a second ago. Uh, where there's a whole presentation on the bus on the way there. So you're learning all of these things. You're applying them in the bus on the drive in the morning. Uh, we're going to Lake of Two Rivers for sunrise. We're going to Ragged Falls. Hopefully we'll see some moose. We usually do in the spring trip. Uh, we're going to hit one of the interpretive walking trails, still to be determined depending on weather. Uh, usually a fairly easy trail to walk and beautiful at the same time. And of course, uh, we're going to have lots of Sigma lenses for people to use. So uh, if you're interested in coming along on these day trips, you can go to www.daytripperphoto.com and you can register through there or you can get a hold of me, um, Brian at daytripperphoto.com. And of course, oh, yeah, Darren's showing some photos. I should have been looking at this. Is that the last spring trip, or is that the fall trip? Yeah, this is the last spring trip. Spring and fall trips are so different. Spring, you get up there. There's still some ice on the water, hopefully. The mist and the... It's just it's beautiful for sunrise. Of course, we have to leave very early. Uh, we're leaving Newmarket at 2 o'clock a.m. Yes, there is a 2 a.m. And uh, there's always some pretty cool things to see. Last time we were there, um, there were monks in the water. Which is weird. All that, these was weird... The fall, that was the fall trip. That was the fall trip. Yeah, that's when my ankle was sprained. Those monks. Silly monks. You find them everywhere. They're always getting into things. <laughs> it was beautiful. They were wearing their bright orange robes around Ragged Falls. It was really cool. There's one of the moose we saw with Mange. <laughs> nope, that's a picture of you. There's me. <laughs> <laughs> Moose with mange. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have too much fun. So, uh, yeah, that's me teaching on the bus on the way up in the mobile classroom. Darren, thank you so much for showing those great photos of me. <laughs> and, and me, Moosey Mange. 
<laughs> uh, since we're on the topic of you know how we can help our viewers, Darren, maybe you can go over one last time of how. Sorry, couldn't couldn't make you out. You froze up. Uh, did I freeze? Can you hear me now? Yep. I can hear you now. Just basically throwing it back, back to you to give your closing. See you later. Oh, um, I'm doing a lot of camera training lately. There's a lot of people that are looking to learn how to use their camera or specific areas of photography. So if anyone's interested, you know, if you got a crunch thing coming up, then I'm always available for private training on location. Uh, you can give me a shout, Darren at dgvirtualtours.com. Uh, we can set something up. Uh, Henry's offers a large selection of classes. Uh, I teach for Henry's. I teach their um, Photoshop and Lightroom series of workshops. So if you're learning how to or want to learn how to use that software, you know, some great opportunities to uh, get some great instruction for, you know, not too bad a price, and you also get a set of downloadable notes with the Henry's workshop. So that's kind of cool. So feel free to check me out and uh, go out there and give it a go. Play with it. Try it. Experiment. You're not going to be wasting a roll of film. That's the one thing you don't have to worry about <laughs> in today's day and age. Yes. Good point. <laughs> good point. And Gabriel, sir, maybe you can uh, tell us what you would, you'd be able to do to help us out as well. Yeah, so um, I don't do training, but I do teach with Day Tripper Photos, so um, that's a lot of fun, but if you... Sorry? I don't, do personal, I don't do personal one-on-one -on -one stuff yet. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, if you have a special event coming up, um, check out our website, um, bousquetphotography.ca. And, um, yeah, if you like what you see, we shoot weddings, we shoot um, any special events, birthday parties, bar mitzvahs, um, confirmations, you name it. Anything where you want all, uh, the whole family to be in the picture, uh, it's nice to hire a photographer and not have to worry about it. And a good one like yourself. A great one. I do try. Oh, you're awesome. <laughs> uh, that's very close to the end of our show today. Uh, really appreciate everybody watching and contributing to the show as always. Uh, we're going to leave you with one last quote. Uh, we talk about our good buddy Ansel Adams, and this is actually a quote from the camera. And by the way, uh, this hasn't been mentioned yet, but the New Market Camera Club is in the process of forming its own library. And there's quite a few books, and you can see some of them are behind me here. Um, they are for our New Market Camera Club members to Ansel Adams, the camera, which I have right up there. Um, to visualize an image in whole or in part is to see clearly in the mind prior to exposure. A continuous projection from composing the image through the final point. So basically, um, you have to think before you shoot. Think about your exposure. It's all up in here. You've got to make it happen. You've got to mm -hmm. think about what you're going to do. Think about your settings and really make that photo your own. So thank you again, Ansel. Thank you, books behind me. And um, yeah, keep on watching our show. Enjoy the New Market Camera Club. Hang out with us in, on our day trips if you want to. And if you have any other questions in the meantime, please send them our way. Uh, is there anything else, guys? No. I think nope. that's about no, it. I think we got, I think we got oh. it covered. One last thing, and I'm just going to quickly throw this out there. Uh, the three of us are going to be having a meeting coming up very shortly, brainstorming about future ideas for our show. If you have any really great ideas, please feel free to email them to us. Uh, to any of the emails that we've talked about that we tonight, uh, myself, Brian, at datriperphoto.com, of course, and uh, let us know what you'd like to see, and we will try and make a show around it. So the next week's episode and future episodes coming up are going to get really cool, and keep on watching because we're only getting better. And congratulations again, Don Kamarechka, for uh, everything that you're doing and getting your notoriety that you so deserve, and that's it. Okay, guys. And, just, and, and Don, we have enough photos of snowflakes Thank you very much. We're done. Okay, enough. No more snow. <laughs> Every morning I've had like two inches of snow when I walk out the door. I'm tired yeah. of snow. Okay. My enough theory snowflakes. is that his pictures is keeping winter li lingering around. <laughs> <laughs> Every time it snows again, I'm thinking, oh, there's Don outside getting some better shots. <laughs> I think even Don is tired of photographing snowflakes for this. By now, he does his hundred snow, hundred days of snowflakes that he does, four hours of edits every single day. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's he's tired of it, and ready to move on to <laughs> the summer stuff. Anyway, day tripper, uh, day tripper photos show. Thanks everybody for watching, and we will continue to do the best we can for you. So take care. 
and have a great week, everybody. See you next week.